a lot of what I was involved in, especially in, in those earlier years of Unbelievable, as I said, was kind of just that that straightforward debating the kind of philosophical, scientific evidence for God. I don't think we're living in that kind of new atheist era of those sorts of questions any longer. I think the new atheist movement to some extent has has been and gone. But we are living in, as you mentioned, a kind of era I see today of a kind of spiritual crisis, a meaning crisis. It's an identity crisis in many ways. And I think that that's been fueled by the loss of the Christian story in our culture. So my contention is that we are kind of story-driven creatures. Well, Justin, I am so excited to have you on. Like I mentioned before we started actually recording here, your work with Unbelievable has been a huge inspiration to me. I think it's one of those rare places over the past couple of decades where a legitimate cross-aisle conversation has been held and you can actually hear experts on both sides of huge issues related to God express their view, steel man their view. It's really an antithesis to a lot of the kind of characterization that I think that believers and atheists can sometimes give each other in the form of memes and the comment section of a YouTube video. But the work that you've done, I feel like, is the opposite, where it's long form, it's thorough, and you really get to hear people out. So I think that that format has been awesome, and I'm I'm basically excited to pick your brain as the host of that experience over two decades. Uh, what I guess I guess kind of tell us the the story maybe of how the conversation has changed from when it first started to some of the conversations that you heard more recently. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. And yeah, I I got to have those conversations on the Unbelievable Show for seventeen and a half years, believe it or not. So I I started it back in two thousand five and only finished up hosting it just just last year in, in April twenty twenty three. And really, yeah, the show began. Uh, you might say around the time that new atheism was building up ahead of steam. This was a very sort of dogmatically anti-theistic form of atheism, very public, led by some interesting individuals like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and so on, each with their own best-selling anti-God book. So it was a really interesting time to be having those conversations. And I was basically, you know, inviting atheists and christians onto this show initially just a radio show and then a podcast and then it got a video dimension and so on but really just to sit around the table and have conversations about god about why they do or didn't believe in god um the science and faith debate um the biblical debate ethics debates all kinds of conversations and yeah it was just a fantastic privilege to host so many of those and trying to do it in that sort of open-handed way where you don't assume you know uh the right answer from the outset but you let both sides go at it and in the process it built a really diverse audience not just of christians who listened but also non-christians agnostics people who were somewhere on the journey so it was a huge privilege to be able to host those dialogues for so many years um and and i would say that in those 17 and a half years i was hosting them yeah the, the conversations inevitably did change because the atmosphere changed, the social issues that were, you know, contentious changed, the um, the theology that was being debated at various points, you know, was changing. So um, so naturally, it tended to follow kind of the drift of culture in that sense as to, to how things changed. But, but it very much started in that heyday of new atheism. So it was those big sort of apologetics debates between characters like William Lane Craig and Richard Dawkins that that were kind of doing the rounds and that I was, I suppose, kind of following in the footsteps of with the unbelievable show. During that time, and, and maybe you can give an example from the earlier period and then maybe an example from more recently, but what have you found are some of, or maybe pick one, the most compelling arguments on the atheistic side that, that you heard or that you felt that, um, maybe there wasn't the best response given to or there was a good response but it was still something that was very challenging for for you as a believer during that time period well obviously the the classic sort of objection to god the, the probably the, the the hardest one to answer is the problem of suffering and that came up in all kinds of different ways so so there were definitely episodes of the show where cogent atheist thinkers put really difficult to answer versions of the problem of evil and suffering to the Christian guest. 
So, so that was definitely kind of always, you know, uh, one that that would always be a difficult one to tackle. Now, I think there are answers to it, but often the answers can seem a, a little bit coldly rational and logical when it comes to the the reality of suffering and evil in the world. So, um, there, there's always a sense in which you can offer a sort of philosophical defence of why God might allow suffering and evil in the world. But I think the problem is in a kind of debate format, it, it can feel a little bit, as I say cold um and and it isn't always the best way of actually engaging the subject necessarily so th those sorts of issues you know would come around regularly i suppose at a personal level the, the some of the issues that that struck me hardest at the time at least though i think with a bit more sort of benefit of hindsight and learning they 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 came to i came to kind of understand them differently but but certainly maybe the first time i had bart airman on the show mm -hmm. who's a, a best-selling well-known critic of the bible who kind of has his own story of deconverting from christian faith to agnosticism because of his biblical studies and the problem of evil um so the first time i had him on the show it was a best-selling book he'd published called misquoting jesus which questioned the historicity and the transmission of the new testament texts over the centuries mm -hmm. and when you just read that book to start with you know it, it's certainly the kind of thing that could shake your faith because you know he he presents a lot of arguments against the you know, essentially the reliability of the scripture in that way. Um, I ended up bringing him on with another New Testament scholar, Peter J. Williams from Cambridge University, who actually um, did a great job of kind of putting the other side of the debate uh, forward. Um, very often, if you only hear one side of the argument, you can come away with a, a slightly skewed idea. And it was just a really helpful way in which Peter J. Williams helped to point out that actually a lot of these issues were sometimes perhaps skewed in a certain direction by Bart M and in terms of the way he laid them out and uh, that a careful reading doesn't necessarily mean that there's there's all these issues um so I came to actually be quite comfortable I'm quite glad actually in the end of that episode because it really helped to uh to, to nuance the way I understood the picture of the Bible and the way it came together I think sometimes it's important for Christians to actually have some of their assumptions challenged in that way because often we do inherit a slightly naive or simplistic version of uh, a form of theology or view of scripture and and sometimes that just has to be you know shaped and molded and and you know and sometimes that's a challenging process but actually what i came out with at the end of that process was actually an even greater respect really for the the historicity of the bible um of the process that you know uh, brought it into being and and just the depth really and the ongoing um sort of relevance and uh, the way that scripture has actually continued to speak through multiple generations you know in lots of different times and places so for me it's it's certainly challenged at various points some of you know the assumptions i perhaps grew up with um which needed challenging but mm -hmm. i've always found actually there's answers in the end if you're willing to kind of maybe have some of your views reshaped some people call that deconstruction um it's probably you know, I, I wouldn't say I ever kind of had this massive sort of faith crisis where everything fell apart and I had to construct it from the bottom up. But there were certainly parts of the building <laughs> that needed sort of seeing mm -hmm. to remodeling um, and sort of uh, cer certainly, you know, um, there. but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I have had a kind of full on deconstruction kind of experience, though I know plenty of people obviously who have had that and for whom some of those conversations and debates were very important in helping them to, to reconstruct something in the process. Yeah, I relate to that a lot. I remember first coming across Bart Ehrman and also really kind of being put on my heels by it. Um, I think a lot of people actually of our age ish, 20s, 30s, you know, kind of dealt with that in a similar way. If it's not too much to ask, can you think of, and I'm, I'm going to link that particular debate here in this video for those who are interested in watching it or that conversation, because it was amazing. But do you happen to remember off the top of your head, even one example of sort of a claim that airmen would make that someone could hear and go, oh my gosh, this really shakes my foundation. And then on the other side, as that claim kind of gets unpacked and contextualized, it ends up not quite having the teeth to it that it seems to have on the surface because i definitely relate to that yeah i mean one one claim he makes in in that book um the uh, uh misquoting jesus is is he kind of puts out this figure that there are more um variations 
between the manuscripts of the gospels than there are words in the new testament so there are literally more kind of effectively mistakes um between the various manuscripts that exist and that on the face of it that sounds like oh wow that's really bad news you know that obviously means there are thousands and thousands of these variants and mistakes and so on and and it, it, but the problem is it, it it's a little bit of a slippery way of putting it because the fact is of course in any study any any textual criticism study the more uh, versions of a manuscript you have the more manuscripts that are out there and obviously there have been thousands and thousands of them produced you know um over the years from mm -hmm. since the first you know new testament documents were written down of course you're going to get lots of variations creep in over time so it's somewhat unsurprising <laughs> that there are so many variants between the manuscripts the point is that when you actually look at those variations the vast vast majority of them turn out to be completely inconsequential they are just um things that are easily rectified a spelling mistake here words in the wrong order but where there's no doesn't make any difference to the text um uh things so the vast majority of them are, are completely of no consequence anyway of the ones that are the, then the whole point of the discipline of um textual criticism is to recover the correct reading and the whole point of the fact is that it's because we have so many manuscripts and because they have so many variations that we can actually do the work of recovering with something like 99.9% .9 accuracy what the original text actually said so it's a little bit um it's it it was a bit it's a bit misleading to kind of just throw numbers out there when in fact it's it's very as as peter j williams put it he sees it as a half glass full rather than a half glass empty it's 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 actually something that's actually works in favor of us being able to recover the original text so that's just one example where i think that you need to be very careful sometimes with the way these things are are, are positioned someone I, I made a video kind of addressing that particular thing that you just said there and someone in the comments said oh it's like the original blockchain and i thought not exactly but that's actually not a bad analogy in the sense that the multiplicity you know that they cross-reference each other and all that um so another thing I wanted to kind of address, you, you were talking about the problem of evil being probably the biggest reason that people don't end up coming around to belief in the God of the Bible. Um, the way that I view that is that at the core of it is a question of God's goodness, basically. It's not, even, it's not necessarily an argument for whether he exists or not, it seems to be an argument of whether he's good or not, at least at least to a large extent. Um, and a lot of times you, I, I at least experience, um, you know, negative comments or, or, you know, comments coming from more of the agnostic atheist side that are very emotionally charged and you can feel the, the anger, the disdain, the ire, um, which is interesting to me because if it was really just a conversation around whether God exists or not, that he exists or not, it wouldn't seem to be such an emotional thing for people. But if it's a conversation primarily around, is this God of the Bible a moral monster, as Richard Dawkins famously said, or is he actually worthy of worship and all, you know, glory and honor and praise? Um, I don't, I'm not saying that this is the the dichotomy for every single person, but I I do think that this the the if in other words, if you believe that God is actually maximally good, I think that affects your desire to consider belief that He's real, versus if you're convinced, sort of a priori or for whatever reason related to suffering or evil, that He's definitely not good, then I. Do you think that that affects your desire to be willing to consider more of the rational arguments? But, okay, so he's good according to the description of who he is, but is he real? D does that make sense? Sort of the um, existence of God versus goodness of God and how those two pieces inform a person's openness to the other? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. Um, and and the idea that if if someone has kind of written off God as a sort of moral monster anyway they're, mm -hmm. they're less willing to sort of think about the the plausibility of god's existence is that is that what i'm hearing yes. you yes. saying that, yeah yes yeah i i'm sure that is the case um yeah i i i you know i i i actually i think 
I think there's lots of motivations, actually, mm -hmm. um, not all of them simply intellectual that go into why someone does or doesn't believe in God. Mm -hmm. um, and very often, sometimes the atheists that I've interacted with, some of them at least, present it as purely about, you know, show me the evidence and I'll believe. But actually, I think I think deep down, <laughs> there's a lot of atheists who who don't particularly like the idea of God, regardless of what necessarily the evidence points to. And that may be because they've picked up a kind of certain cultural ideas around God, that God is kind of judgmental and, you know, wants to, you know, take the things away from them that they enjoy and that kind of thing. And and also because obviously people have painful experiences where they there's, there's a very natural inclination to say, well, if there is a God, so he certainly wouldn't have allowed this to happen. So I'm kind of, it, it sort of turns them off the, the whole idea of even entertaining the possibility, if you like. So I think, I think you're right. I think that there's definitely going to be people for whom that, I mean, interestingly, it moves us on somewhat to, to some of the material in my newer book, but mm -hmm. the person I heard this from most recently was Ian Hersey Ali, actually. So Ian Hersey Ali was one of the new atheists um, in her time, Somali born, um sort of uh immigrant to the the netherlands who because of her really bad experience of islam um growing up indoctrinated in the muslim brotherhood and sort of being put into a forced marriage and fleeing that she rejected islam and essentially rejected god on the basis of this terrible kind of version of god that she had encountered and um and what's really interesting is that her recent sort of embrace of Christianity now, some 20 years on from her sort of new atheist years, um, one of the reasons she gave for why she felt able to do that was she, she and she sort of revealed this in a conversation she had for, for unheard. Um, she said she was seeing a, a therapist because she was experiencing sort of depression and sense of emptiness. And the therapist said, well, I think you're spiritually bankrupt. And she said, um, well, what do you mean? Uh, I can't believe in God. Um, and the therapist basically said, why, well, why not? And she said, well, because the God I grew up with was a monster. Mm. And the therapist said, well, if you could believe in a God, what kind of a God do you think you might be able to believe in? And, and so she started to kind of describe the kind of God that would be worthy of, if you like, would she could like potentially believe in. And and what she says is that she found that what she was describing was was Jesus Christ. And that was the kind of the thing that tipped her over into thinking, well, look, maybe I need to give this a second look, another try. And she, you know, has been going to church. She says she's embraced Christianity. So it's almost like in, in Ian Hersey Alley's case, um, she had kind of there was a kind of blanket rejection of God because of the kind of God that she had in her mind from mm. from from her background. But once she kind of reoriented the possibility of of that god actually being a good god suddenly it appears the possibility of god's existence wasn't a delusion to her any longer it wasn't something she she kind of rejected out of hand and and i just wonder in in a way how many people are having a have a similar experience to ian hersey ali where as you say they they're kind of they've closed down the possibility of god's existence primarily on the basis of a picture of God that they've received in some way. And, and therefore they're sort of, well, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not even they're They're less inclined to entertain the possibility that such a God exists, you know, however good your abstract philosophical arguments may be for that. Right. God. right. Which, which frankly, if someone were trying to convince me that, that, you know, Hitler was God or, or was good or something, and I was convinced that he wasn't, I really wouldn't have any interest in even considering that because I'm convinced that he's a moral monster. So it, it makes sense psychologically. Um, I wanted to ask you because I heard you recently talking about um, the power of story and the fact that even from a psychological perspective, humans are sort of wired to to view ourselves within a story and that that gives us meaning and, and all of this. And so I wanted you to kind of unpack that idea around story. And then within that, to try to steel man the atheist story about humanity. And then maybe by contrast, for those who maybe haven't heard it, but have only ever heard, you know, glimpses or pieces, what is the Christian story about humanity? And, and maybe through that, I'm, I'm giving you a tall order here, but maybe through that to 
to begin to talk about meaning, and I, I'm thinking now also of Jordan Peterson and this idea of that there's a meaning crisis, but I'll, I'll let you kind of take that where you want, but I think that this idea about story is so is so relevant and also kind of how it ties into meaning, but I, I, I will let you take it from here. Yeah, so, so I think that there, there's a kind of different approaches to apologetics and um, a lot of what I was involved in, especially in, in those earlier years of Unbelievable, as I said, was kind of just that that straightforward debating the kind of philosophical, scientific evidence for God. Um, and I think those were the kinds of questions the new atheists were asking. So there was a kind of it was a natural need to respond in that way. I do think the conversation has moved on. And and that's partly what this new book is about, the surprising rebirth of belief in God. Because I don't think we're living in that kind of new atheist era of those sorts of questions any longer. I think the new atheist movement to some extent has has been and gone. But we are living in, as you mentioned, a kind of era I see today of a kind of spiritual crisis, a meaning crisis. It's an identity crisis in many ways. And I think that that's been fueled by the loss of the Christian story in our culture. So my contention is that we are kind of story driven creatures uh, really we need something a story that kind of makes sense of our lives otherwise we um we kind of fall into depression um we can't make sense of life um you know i think there there are psychologists there's one called jonathan gottschall who who wrote this whole concept down in a book where he talked about the fact that if we feel like we're bouncing around chaotically without any kind of meaning purpose and identity sort of a narrative you know behind our life then then it leads to this kind of malaise of depression um a lack of meaning purpose and so on um but the problem and the, the thing is that i think subliminally our culture the western culture has had a story like that that has actually given people a sense of their place mm -hmm. in a kind of created order and it's been the christian story about you know you were created by a god who loves you you were made in his image life is difficult but actually there is a kind of purpose behind the pain um there's because that god came in person to share that the the joys and the the the, the challenges of life and rose again it, you know to give you a hope that actually death not that there is a sort of eternal purpose even in your small part in this big picture so you know when whether people kind of understood that explicitly or not i think it was just the water they swam in you know for, for 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 many years but of course since i guess from the enlightenment onwards but really accelerated in, in the in the last hundred years or so we've had this sort of secular worldview that has swept in and it kind of has swept away in a large part in the west the christian story it's not the way in which people think of their life anymore and but people still need a story to make sense of life and so they inevitably you know in the absence of that story they go looking for other stories they latch on to other things but often these stories are are not as effective they don't do the job um they um, put a lot more pressure on the individual so for instance i think a lot of people today are looking to fill that kind of god-shaped story with a story around their sexuality or gender, for instance, that's become, uh, you know, a hot button issue where a lot of people feel that's where the meaning and identity and the purpose of their life lies. But hmm. that, I think, is a really difficult one to sustain in our culture because it puts especially young people under a huge amount of pressure to kind of maintain a particular identity and to kind of almost create it from scratch, you know, given the, the multiplicity of ways in which you can identify these days. So so I think uh, so that's one example you could pick, uh, you know, sort of um other examples from the right wing you know there is the the cult of donald trump i would say is another example of this idea of people looking for a story to make sense of their life um so so this 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 for me is is kind of really important for us to recognize that the questions people are asking are as much about that sense of identity as it is about this kind of more abstract question of does god exist i think those two questions are in intimately linked but you i think the the job of the apologist now is is not to simply answer that that question of the new atheist does god exist hmm. it's to kind of give people a sense of what kind of story can make sense of their life and then i think people can be open to considering whether god may figure in that and and kind of as you were saying earlier on it's once you've kind of got the i it's it's only once people would almost want god to exist 
that they're kind of actually going to be open to some actual evidence for God existing in my view. So I think you mm. do have to start very often with the, with the story, which makes them wish that it were true. Um, and then you might have a good chance of showing them that in fact it is true. A warm shout out to all the guys out there dealing with hair loss. It's such a common thing for men, but no one really likes to talk about it. No one wants to deal with it. Luckily there is something that can make a difference and that something is Keeps. Keeps makes treating hair loss easier, more affordable, and you can do their whole deal from your home. No doctor's visits, just expert care delivered discreetly to your door. If you wanted to test Keeps for yourself, all you'd have to do is fill out a quick, online consultation form on the website. It literally takes about a minute and then they tailor a treatment plan specifically for you. Keeps offers FDA approved treatments that are clinically proven. We're talking literally 90% effectiveness at treating hair loss and a boost in hair growth up to 35%. They also have a hair thickening shampoo, a conditioner and styling pomade. It typically takes about six months to see the results. So you'll know pretty quick if it's working for you. They've helped nearly a million guys keep their hair. They have over 4,500 five-star reviews. They also show you real before and after photos of other people so you can see their results before making the decision for yourself. For my special offer, visit keeps.com forward slash daily dose of wisdom, or you can click the link in the description to see if it's a good fit for you. Now, with that being said, let's dive back into the video. I haven't actually thought about this in the exact way that you just described, but this is actually really interesting. I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Jordan Peterson's sort of hierarchy of values idea. And it sounds like if you remove God from that pinnacle position in the hierarchy, then something that would otherwise be a secondary thing slides up to the top, whether that on sort of the, the left side or whatever is more of the gender identity stuff, or whether it is, like you said, the kind of Christless conservatism that becomes this almost religious thing. Uh, that's, that's an interesting idea. And I think it makes a, a lot of sense where something has to be in the place of religion within, you know, within your worldview. Um, fascinating. Yeah. I, and I, that's what I, I, I've appreciated, you know, Peterson's take on this. I, I think there definitely is something, I think, you know, Blaise Pascal probably, you know, put his finger on it as well a few hundred years ago when he said there is this God shaped vacuum in the heart of every person and it can't be filled with any created thing. It can only be filled with God made known through Jesus Christ. And I think Jordan Peterson is kind of just saying the same thing in Jungian terms, you know, this yeah. hierarchy of values and that whatever you put at the top kind of serves the place of God for you. But of course, anything other than God, in my opinion, is always going to let you down. It's always it's never going to um, give give that sense of meaning and purpose ultimately that that, that people are really craving and looking mm -hmm. for. So so I think I think, yeah, I think Peterson's onto something there. Speaking of Peterson, I, I've kind of made this commentary a, a decent amount on this channel, but I am looking at his path through, like you said, Jungian thought and archetype. And I'm, and I'm in my mind kind of comparing that to C.S. Lewis's journey to Christ in, in those years before his path was a deep understanding of mythology, but there is a similarity in these two directions toward the idea of, is it just an abstraction? In other words, is a myth just a metaphor or is an archetype just a metaphor? Or is there some real thing that all metaphor is downstream from? Is In other words, is ultimate truth literal truth? And this to me is a really interesting question. Lewis ended up seeing that it was and saying, you know, Jesus is the true myth. He's the, the literal embodiment of the deepest human longings in an actual literal person in history. And it's fascinating to me because I've seen Peterson, I'm sure you're familiar with that clip where Peterson actually starts to cry as he talks about how he puts it, the narrative world and, and the literal world, you know, meeting the word, the word becoming flesh. And he, he says, that's a horrifying. That's a terrifying thought. But I want to, I guess, lead the conversation there because it's we're, we're naturally heading there. Um, and to, to me, it, it, it kind of raises this question of, are we saying that belief in God or sort of like the, the construct of Christianity is a useful delusion? Is it a good psychological trick or is it, is it a literal bedrock that sort of the, the, the longings are fulfilled through. And I think that that, th this is like right where I feel like Peterson is, is at. And it's, I, I just think this is fascinating. 
Uh, yeah. I, and again, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with all the things you've said there, basically. And I do think there's there's a huge overlap with Peterson's journey and, and Lewis when you look at them. Um, exactly as you say, Lewis absolutely invested in mythology. That was what set his mind alight, you know, the, it fired the imagination. And he he talks, you know, famously in, in his, his book about his conversion, um, Surprised by Joy, about how he had these two hemispheres, you know, the one that kind of was the atheist side of him, which recognised that, yes, the world is just, it, it's just, uh, you know, cold, rational logic and, you know, material stuff. And the other side, which was sort of all of this imagination and legend and mythology. And he thought he could never bring these two together, that he was going to be miserably kind of constantly this dichotomy of the two. When, um, and what brought them together, of course, was the person of Jesus Christ. And that that famous conversation he had with J.R.R. Tolkien that that helped him to realize that that um, Christ, if you like, was the embodiment um, in real historical time and place of all of those mythologies and stories and and that he didn't have to kind of you know live just in his imagination or or, or accept the other world of the the purely material that actually they came together in a person and yeah I've, i i know exactly the clip you're talking about in that conversation peterson has with john and Peugeot when he seems to kind of come very close to saying something very similar that it's in the person of jesus christ that that narrative world of meaning um seems to collide with the objective world of you know history and science and so on so um so i think there's definitely something there and um and then sorry what was the, the next bit you went on to well well i was just i was just thinking about how within well i guess i guess i'll i'll reframe the question in this way is with, within these conversations that you're now having on your by the way i'll plug it amazing new podcast called the surprising rebirth of belief in god everyone go check it out and what you're doing there is in a sort of audio documentary style you're chronicling different stories of people who are sort of previously prominent atheists and now are are considering belief again and so i guess i'll reframe the question in light of that to say do you feel that these people that you're documenting are sort of for the time being in that phase of uh believing you know the christian story is useful we're not necessarily saying it's literally true but we need religion even if it is a psychological trick it's better than atheism are we in that sort of like lewis a couple years before he actually converted phase or 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 are some people actually going all the way to I, yeah and apologies I've I've now caught up with with the next question you asked which was about yeah the, this useful fiction versus whether it, it's the real thing and and I think I think it's it's a mixed bag it's a mixed picture so a lot of the people I'm chronicling in the podcast and indeed in the book as well are people who are who are in different places on that spectrum some I think probably are still in the it's a useful fiction kind of form so, so someone who's definitely there i would say um or at least from from what i know of, of what he said recently is um um uh, uh, brett weinstein for instance um mm -hmm. who's a evolutionary biologist um but who's takes a very different approach to religion to say richard dawkins who says religion is bad for you it's a delusion it's a kind of evolutionary misfiring effectively and brett weinstein says no it's there for a reason um it, because it's been really helpful um so he sees it as a useful fiction he says it's literally false but metaphorically true is the way mm -hmm. he likes to talk about religion so that's a very kind of he's very clearly you know camping out on the kind of useful fiction i would say similarly jonathan Haidt to some extent again mm -hmm. someone who absolutely recognizes the value of religious traditions um you know speaks very warmly about you know the you know lots of the the biblical aspects that give give meaning and wisdom but again i think he he says it's a useful fiction. It's not actually true, but it's it's really useful. I I and maybe you know applauds you know and encourages people if they feel inclined to be religious to do so because it's, um, but then I think you've got some people who are kind of more teetering on the edge of, not just acknowledging that there's a useful aspect psychologically, socially, culturally to to Christianity, but who are thinking well, it's only really helpful if it's true actually, and mm. it's no good in the end just sort of being slightly snobbish and saying well it's helpful if people believe this but we're a little bit above that and we've realized you know that it's it's not really true and and i would say you've got people in that camp who maybe might include tom holland for instance where mm -hmm. he really understands that he wants the idea of human rights to be true 
but he knows it's a theological invention. So if it's true, there has to be a God and there has to be something about this Christian story that kind of basically grounds it that is true. And I think he's one of those people on a journey to kind of possibly edging towards accepting that that there's something that actually grounds this in reality. I think Ian Hersey Alley is, is clearly maybe a little bit further along in that journey. She's decided actually I, I acknowledge the usefulness of this, but I've got to I've got to leap into it for, mm -hmm. for this to actually work, basically. And then there's plenty of people who have made the, you know, the full sort of leap, if you like. So I talk in the book and you may have heard on some recent episodes of the podcast um, conversations with people like Paul Kingsnorth, who's a fascinating example of a celebrated author and poet here in the UK, highly intelligent um, person who has had this extraordinary adult conversion, you know, in the last few years to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. And and really, you know, he he would say he bounced around in a lot of different places, but ultimately found that the story that made sense of everything in a totalizing kind of way was ultimately Christianity. And he were, he had not expected it to be. But when he jumped in, he found this was the thing that, that made sense of it all. Um, so so I think there's people on all on different parts of this spectrum. Um, and I'm just really interested in in telling all of their stories because I think they're all signs that something's changing in our mm -hmm. culture because none of it, whether whether you see that it kind of on the useful fiction side of the kind of the Brett Weinstein or the Paul Kingsnorth who's jumped in, this I, I title this a surprising rebirth of belief in God, which is very different to the sort of new atheist heyday where people like that would have been laughed off the stage, at, you know, some 20 years ago. I think it's interesting sort of just thinking about the basic plot points of this where new atheism actually sprung up in the broader context of basically postmodernism and relativism. And then it was very modernistic in a lot of ways. It, it wasn't, you know, that works for you, but it was like, no, we, we feel a very certain way about this and we're going to make a case against it. But now it seems that like you kind of said, that has sort of aged out or phased out for a lot of people. It's been tried and found wanting for for a lot of people. And now it seems like uh, you're kind of, it's, it, tell me if this is right, but that the idea that there's utility in belief in God is at least a gateway for maybe a certain percentage of, of people back. And now we're sort of in this sort of this middle ground space where, okay, so there's a utility to it, but is it really real? Is it just useful? And this, it's interesting. I, I, I think you're right. I, and I think it is people like Tom Holland, for instance, are having a huge effect in this, in this area where they're, they're just as secular historian in Tom's case saying, look, if you actually go and do some history, you'll quickly discover that all of the things you most value in terms of Western liberal democracy, human rights, equality, progress, freedom, they didn't come from science. They didn't come from atheism. They didn't come from the enlightenment. All of those things are actually downstream of this Christian revolution. That's actually the thing that gave you. Now that doesn't mean it's true, but it's waking a lot of people up to the fact that they're, they're kind of reliant on the Christian story at some level. And, and that alone, I think, is enough to sort of shake people out of their kind of assumptions that, oh, you know, we, we all just live in this, you know, common sense secular era to realize actually, no, that we, we, this, these beliefs that I hold aren't necessarily the only game in town. You know, it could have turned out a different way. There are other parts of the world with significantly increasing interests, Putin's Russia, China, where they might have a very different idea of what life is about. So I think it's it's you shouldn't underestimate, you know, even the people who aren't saying it's true, but who are just saying, pointing people back towards the the values that they got from Christianity. It, it can have an important effect. Likewise, Jordan Peterson, very difficult to pin down exactly where he stands on the God question. Um, but he's definitely opened a doorway for people to take it more seriously. And I, I know plenty of people who have stepped through that and have now baptized believing christians because jordan peterson kind of gave them intellectual permission to take it seriously again often yes initially in a kind of practical way said your life might be better off if you went and read the bible again or thought about praying you know even if it was only kind of suggested as a sort of purely psychologically helpful you know thing i think yeah. enough people find though that in the process they can actually take the story seriously and uh, so so i you know yeah, I, I just think that that there is a trajectory that's that's that that goes on, if you like, from 
socially useful to people actually taking it seriously enough to potentially believe in it. Well, another thing I think is fascinating, the kind of the expose that you're doing and the impact that that I'm sure will have on people who were actually raised in Christian homes, attended Christian schools or Catholic schools, but then, and this, I can think of for myself, dozens of friends who this is their story. Then they went on to college and they were, you know, biology majors at UF or whatever, and they were basically presented the atheistic materialistic worldview from a college educated perspective, and it completely shattered their seemingly shallow foundation. Um, and so it's this interesting thing where you you get Christianity at a grade school level and you get atheism at a college level, and so it it feels like that's the more intellectual or adult worldview to have. But what, but what you're showing here is actually something that I think will be very useful for those sort of deconstructed Christians as well who are probably, well, who I know personally some are struggling with that meeting crisis. And to be able to show, I think, that story as well that, you know, let's just pause for a second and consider is it that all of Christianity is ridiculous childhood fairy tales, or is it that the the version of things that you were presented was for a ten year old kid? But there's actually the, but there's actually a lot more depth there to be gleaned. Now now go back and do it as an adult, and I think that's where a lot of people are at as well. Yeah, and and I think a lot of those young men who you know have turned out for Jordan Peterson lectures over the last several years. Probably some of them had some kind of vague church, you know, background, um, but they, all they remember is a kind of Sunday school version of Christianity. And suddenly this person from outside the church starts to talk in very serious terms about the depth of these Bible stories. And suddenly their, their minds get blown and they're like, oh, I had never even realized that it could be taken seriously. And I think that's that is the great danger is exactly as you say. Um, we don't, especially with young people, potentially actually expose them to a kind of the depth of Christianity so that when they do end up going, as you say, to secondary education, higher education, suddenly it appears childish. Um, but I think that's that's down to to the church. It's very often failed in that sense to to do that kind of catechesis that that does just help young people to engage a deeper level of faith um, so that they don't suddenly think that it's all all childish and so on um i also think that deconstruction itself is to, uh, the where i see it being driven the most is in um certain forms of evangelical christianity in america where i think um it's a certain form of christianity that people are rejecting rather mm -hmm. than christianity orthodox christianity itself and and mm -hmm. i sometimes just think people need more exposure to a wider breadth of christian tradition and thought frankly yeah. and that you would head a lot of that stuff off at the pass if you had just given you know people a chance to experience something beyond their own very narrow culturally conditioned version of christianity which you know is is has not been the experience of the vast majority of people for the last two thousand years or indeed most people around the world so i i do fear that the the deconstruction is is from a very specific type of fundamentalist evangelical christianity that that, that people inevitably end up growing in up in in parts of the usa yeah I, I completely agree with you it's it's a classic case of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and i think that you know the bathwater, a lot of it does need to get thrown out and i think that we need to present things in a more deep mature way like you said from the from the onset because people are going to have questions as as people grow up they're going to have questions that that have answers but those answers need to be presented i think um i in my opinion sort of on the front end like let's get out in front of all of the attacks or whatever you want to call it that you're going to face in college and let's just go ahead and have the whole worldview conversation now while you're 16 rather than trying to safeguard anybody from yeah yeah I, I, first thing i think in an internet age the worst thing that a christian parent can do is try to or, or any a church could do is try to kind of put put a young person in a bubble where they don't yeah. get exposed to 
you know other points of view to objections and everything it's 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 an absolute disaster because you you can only keep that bubble from popping for so long and once it does well you know what's going to happen so i i absolutely agree with you and that's why you know when we're around the dinner table with our kids i want to have the conversations now i want to hear what they're hearing i want to even you know put the objections to them myself i don't want to just sort of make out this is all you know will come kind of make sense at you know uh, at every level I, I want to kind of introduce the complexity and mis mysteriousness and and just you know and there are going to be some things where i'm going to be honest and say i don't think i have the full answer to that but mm -hmm. that's okay because that's an adult response you know we don't have everything sewn up in the end but what i can say is this worldview is a more compelling view than any other i've encountered it makes more sense at multiple levels doesn't mean there's no questions that need you know that go unanswered but um but for me yeah have those conversations early rather than sort of allow them to lose their faith once they once they leave the house and enter the adult world well let me put it in a very bold audacious way although we might not have everything sewn up in my opinion if you if a person rightly understands themselves in the context of the human condition, the problem of evil and their own participation in it as an individual, and has a right biblical understanding of God through the person of Jesus, they will at least want Christianity to be true. Now, whether or not it is, is a different question. And that's what you said. There's a lot of different things that re are required to make that case. But I, I believe that a right understanding of oneself and a right understanding of God through the lens of Jesus will cause a person to wish it were true. Again, whether it actually is, is a different question. But what do, what do you think about that idea? I, I, I think that's right. I, I think that obviously it's so much more than just kind of teaching facts. I mean, the example that a young person peeks up through their church, through their parents is, is so formative. And and we shouldn't forget that. And so, you know, I can fully understand, you know, a church may have in, in principle really great sort of uh, teaching. But if what that young person sees in the par parental kind of example is is toxic or, or or whatever, that that can be really difficult, you know, to overcome. That's that's so it's it's not that there's sort of any easy answer to it. But I do agree that, you know, all other things being equal. The, the Christian story, the Christian view of reality is by far for me, the most realistic, the most hopeful, um, the one that that kind of makes best sense of life. And to that end, I would want to, you know, in having those conversations with uh, a young person or with someone who's, you know, sort of considering Christianity, I want to expose them to, well, here are all the other ways of looking at life. And here are some of the pros and here are some of the cons, you know, be honest, don't, don't, you know, and, and sort of, rigorously you know you know stare stare them down and look at what what the other options are in my view when you do that christianity again comes out top because it's not as though you know one of the biggest mistakes i, I think christians make is that somehow all it's all about simply defending our worldview you know and we have to show that it's you know true and give all the right arguments i think it's also about looking at other worldviews mm -hmm. and and noting that all of them have certain deficiencies too, uh, that we're all in that sense, whether we call ourselves an atheist, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Christian, there's an element of faith involved, you know, uh, mm -hmm. lots of atheists think there isn't any faith involved in atheism. I think there is. If you, if you're an atheist who believes in human rights, there's some faith going on there. And I don't think you can support that view on atheism. So, so you, I think it's important to, to show that, that we are all standing, you know, um, in, within a worldview. And the question is, um, who's like, where does the evidence point ultimately? And and I, I think it lands up, you know, very favorably in terms of Christianity. Well, I have to be honest, at the top of the hour here, I was nervous to talk to the man who's facilitated conversations with Jordan Peterson and Richard Dawkins. And here I am wishing we could go another hour. However, we're out of time. But thank you so much for your time today, Justin. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Brandon. Um, if, if folks want to get hold of the book or the podcast, um, my website's a good place to go, justinbriley.com. You can find links to, to both of them there, but it's been, been really fun chatting with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Definitely go check out the podcast, people. I've been binging it and it's awesome and very unique. So go give it a listen. <laughs>